everybody, welcome back to See Elise. Today you're gonna see Elise clean. And crime. Welcome to episode two of my cleaning and crime series. My name is Elise and I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house and do my chores. It's my favorite thing. So I've decided to merge the two and I'm going to give you a cleaning motivation video while I sit in a little bubble in the corner and tell you a true crime story that interests me. If you like to listen to true crime while you clean your house, then subscribe because I'm gonna post a new episode of Cleaning and Crime every Saturday. Let's just jump right into it. Today on the cleaning front, on this cleaning video day, we had just gotten back from a road trip. So it was one of those situations where we got home and just dumped everything all over the floor, suitcases, clothes, makeup, whatever. And so I needed to pick all that up and get the house back to the neutral state. Hopefully you enjoy and it gives you some motivation while you're cleaning today. Now, for the true crime case that I'm going to tell you about today, we're going to talk about the murders of Dan O'Connell and James Ellison at the O'Connell Family Funeral Home in Hudson, Wisconsin. I actually live nearby, so obviously I was interested to look it up because of proximity. Once I started getting all of the details that came out over the years after the shootings, it was like, what, 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 ew, what? On February 5th, 2002, Hudson police were informed around 1.40 p.m. there was a shooting at the town's funeral home. When they arrived, they found the bodies of 39-year-old Dan O'Connell, the director of the funeral home, and his 22-year-old intern, James Ellison. Dan was seated at his desk and he had a gunshot wound to the head from a nine millimeter handgun. And James was on the floor near the desk, also with a gunshot wound to the head from a nine millimeter handgun. Now the police department, as well as the entire community was completely shocked, rocked by these shootings. There, this, it was a small town. The kind of place where you keep your car doors unlocked and your front door unlocked and there hadn't been a homicide in Hudson for 25 years. Not only that, but Dan O'Connell was a well-known and well-liked member of the community. He rode in the town parades. He, he was the pepper king for crying out loud. He was the town of Hudson's pepper king in the annual pepper festival. He's a guy that everybody liked. And pretty much every person in the town that passed away had their funeral at the O'Connell family funeral home. And poor James, he was only 22, he was Dan's intern. He had his whole life ahead of him. Why would anybody want him dead? It was so shocking. Like no, Nobody knew of any enemies or any beef going on with these two. So it was like, what? There was no signs of a struggle. There was no signs of a robbery. The investigators were completely stumped immediately. And they're devastated because, I mean, the two investigators, they were like, Dan was our friend. And now we have to investigate our friend's murder. Can you imagine? God. And it wouldn't be until three years after the shootings that they got any answers about what happened that day. So let's go back. Who was Dan O'Connell, the Pepper King? Like I said, Dan was one of those guys that everybody in town knew. He was super involved in his community, super involved in the church. He was described as super friendly. His family stated that they always laughed when he said, I'm just gonna go out for a few minutes and run this errand because they knew he was gonna be gone for a really long time and he was frequently late to everything because everywhere he went, he would be like, oh, hey, John, and he would start a long conversation with everyone he bumped into. He also knew just what to say with grieving families. He helped all the families plan the funerals for their loved ones. I think it takes a special personality to be able to do that. I would definitely say all of the wrong things and I would be the worst at it, but some people have that gift. And Dan was definitely one of those people and he helped families through the entire process. Once he helped plan a funeral for a teenage girl who died in a car accident, tragically, when he was consoling the father of the teenage girl and the father told him, I don't have a suit to wear to her funeral. He apparently took the suit jacket off of his own back and put it on the man and said, I will loan you everything that you need for the funeral. Don't worry about a thing. Just a little extra history when Dan was young he received an EMT degree when he was still in high school and then he went on to graduate with honors from the University of Minnesota's Mortuary Science Department. He then met his wife Jenny and they got married and they had two kids. He just seemed like such a nice guy that was nice to everybody and everybody liked him. So what the heck? And also James Ellison, Dan's intern, he was also from the University of Minnesota from the Mortuary Science Program and he wanted to work with Dan because he wanted to learn from the best of the best and he had big dreams of running a funeral home of his own one day and he had a serious girlfriend in college and was planning on marrying her after graduation. So where in the world would you start with something like this? Detectives Sean Petit and Jeffrey Knopps, they examined the crime scene closely and forensic evidence gave them some insight into what the heck happened that day. So they believe the shooting happened between 11.40 and 1.40 p.m. By the position of the bodies, they determined that Dan stood up from his desk, faced the front entrance, where presumably the gunman was, 
and was hit in the forehead with a gunshot that knocked him back into his chair. It's amazing that forensic science can just like piece everything together just by the bullet trajectory and the blood spatter. It, it is fascinating. Then they believed that James heard the commotion, came running, saw Dan in his chair, looked up and saw the gunman, put up his hand to defend himself, and he was shot through his fingers into his forehead, and he died, and he landed on the floor. And then the gunman just walked out. So who the hell was it? So just by looking at the scene, the detectives started to believe that Dan was the target of the shooting and James was just collateral damage. He just had to be killed because he was a witness, basically, which is so, it's all sad, but that's so sad. Now, even though police had pretty much figured out what they believed happened at the scene, they still had zero suspects. Detective Sean Petit knew Dan personally very well, so he jumped right in interviewing the people closest to Dan. First person he talked to was Dan's wife, Jenny. It's always the spouse, right? And even Jenny knew that. She was like, I knew I was gonna be the first one to be questioned because it's like, it's always the spouse. Jenny was devastated. She had no idea who would want Dan dead. The detectives were trying to figure out, was there trouble in the marriage? Was there an affair? Was there any really big life insurance policies that somebody was gonna cash in on. However, Jenny was quick to shut that down. Dan was her soulmate, her best friend. They had a lovely marriage. They had two children. They didn't fight. Everything was great. But also she had an alibi. After ruling out his wife, they decided to examine the last 24 hours of his life and try to pin down the timeline to figure out who he was with at the time of the shooting. So detectives decide to start at the beginning of the day and interview everybody down the timeline until they have pieced together the day and figured out if there's any beef with any of the people he met with that day. They worked through his whole day and there was nothing. Nobody close to Dan was suspicious. Everybody had alibis. There was nothing. So they're like, let's just, let's go back to the crime scene. They ended up examining Dan's calendar on his desk and they found that there was an appointment that Dan had at 1 p.m. that he had bumped back to two. And since that was right around the time of death, they're like, okay, whoever took that slot, probably our shooter. So now they're gonna move on to more like colleagues and people that he worked with in the community, start interviewing those people. They're trying to figure out if someone's like, oh yeah, I heard he was meeting with so-and-so or I'm like one, you know, they're hoping somebody will just like give him a tip that will help break the case. Also, Dan and his family attended St. Pat's Catholic Church in town. And being the town's funeral director, he had a, you know, a personal working relationship with the church and with Father Ryan Erickson, who was the Roman Catholic priest and the acting pastor at the church. Father Erickson was considered a friend of Dan's and he worked with him frequently and closely. So detectives question Father Erickson and they're basically like, so what do you think happened? What do you know? Like, what do you hear? And Father Erickson told them that he had been hearing people gossiping while they were all having drinks at the bowling alley and people were saying Dan and Jenny's marriage was shit. Well, he didn't say shit. He was a priest. And there was rumors that Dan was having an affair with his secretary, Bonnie. <gasps> and like, well shit, this is news to the detectives. Jenny was like, no way, no affairs and marriage was great. And now here's Father Erickson's like, that's not what I heard. I heard he was stooping the secretary. So anyway, police interview Bonnie's husband. They're like trying to figure out, is he a jealous husband? Did he know about, you know, rumors of an affair? Was he an angry dude? What's he know? So they interview Dwayne. Dwayne's a dairy farmer, right? You know, it's Wisconsin, so. So they flat out ask the guy, yo, Dwayne, are you a jealous husband? What's your deal? And immediately Dwayne starts going off. I didn't like Dan. I didn't like that Dan was always taking my wife to conferences. She should be home with the family. She shouldn't be out going to funeral home conferences. Like, dude, go by yourself. She doesn't need to be with you. I don't know if he said it like that, but that's just my dramatic interpretation of what he said. So obviously he was suspicious, right? So they're thinking, okay, this is great. We got the jealous husband did it theory. It's working for us. But guess what? He had an alibi. Of course he did. Of course he did. Dairy farmer. People saw him milking cows or whatever, doing doing dairy farmer stuff at the time. So, not him. Okay, so they move on to phone records because they're like, okay, just chatting up the rumor mill is not working either. Everybody's milking cows, everybody's busy. So they go to the phone records and they're gonna narrow down the timeline of like Dan at his desk, like who was he calling? So he made an outgoing call at 1.07 p.m. And then a call came in to James's cell phone at 1.22 p.m., but it went unanswered. So now they think they have a tighter timeline. They think it happened between 1.07 and 1.22. But that unfortunately is where the leads dried up. So what now? Go to the funeral. If you learned anything from Law & Order SVU, you gotta go to the funeral, you gotta wear sunglasses, you gotta look at all the people, and you gotta see if anybody's looking suspicious, if anybody's too sad, 
if anybody's not sad enough. And boy, was there a crowd. Hundreds of people crammed into the church and hundreds of people were outside. It was standing room only, spilled out into the streets. Because like I said, everybody in town knew him. Everybody loved Dan. And meanwhile, detectives are inside, outside. They're looking at everybody. They're watching. They're out running license plates on every car in the parking lot and on the streets. Unfortunately, nothing out of the ordinary happened and they got no leads from the funeral. And this is where the investigation would stall, which sucks. Okay, so about a month later, Hudson police received a tip from the FBI. There was a religious extremist group that was against the practice of embalming bodies. They were called the Rest to Jesus Ministries. So if you're against the practice of embalming bodies, then you're probably pretty pissed at funeral homes because they all do that because, isn't that the law? Like, let's look that up. Okay, I was wrong. So I just looked up Wisconsin. There are no laws or regulations requiring embalming. And I learned something today. But anyway, I think a lot of funeral homes do embalm bodies. If you're a funeral director, leave me a comment down below. Do you embalm your bodies? We're dying to know. It seems like a really weird thing to be mad about. But that's just my opinion. But yeah, they sent out like 400 letters threatening funeral homes about their embalming practices. The leader of the group, Catherine Padilla, sent out these letters and they threatened like death to funeral directors that were embalming, which is like, really intense. And she had been arrested before for disorderly conduct and two counts of stalking. So they interview Catherine and she's this prophet to 25 individuals, which I'm like, you got 25 people to come and that's impressive. Apparently she held meetings weekly at her home and she would give these big sermons and she would speak in tongues. I bet that was wild. So investigators talk to her and she's like, these letters are just an expression of my religious beliefs. I mean no harm to anyone. And that the death threats were taken out of context. And while she was pretty different and she was pretty out there, of course, she had an alibi. She was at home having a cult meeting, giving a sermon and talking in tongues or whatever she was doing. As long as she wasn't hurting anybody, she's got no beef with me. That was the last lead they had to work and it started to go cold. Detective Sean Petty told Jenny, Dan's wife, he would not give up and he would work this case until it was solved, until the day he died if needed. It, even if it meant another 20 years on the force before he grew retired, he would not rest until he solved this case. And poor Jenny, my God, like, it's pretty obvious that it was somebody in town that knew him, right? So she's gonna spend every day like looking over her shoulder, not knowing who to trust. One of you fuckers probably killed my husband. Oh, can you imagine? In 2004, Two years later, Dan's sister, Kathy, reached out to the VDOX Society. Now, if you don't know what the VDOX Society is, they're a Philadelphia-based members-only club made up of mostly retired investigators, forensic psychologists, retired police officers, active duty police officers, and other volunteer forensic experts. They meet, they discuss cold cases, it's helpful to go over these cold cases with a fresh set of eyes. They can often find new leads and help police further their investigations and help close these cold cases. One of the founding members of the group, criminal profiler Richard Walter, he took on Dan's case and he met with the detectives in Hudson and went over all the evidence. He determined that it was not a crime of passion. It wasn't like a spur of the moment decision after a fight. It was cold and calculated. Somebody walked in, one shot to Dan's head, one shot to James's head, and walked out. It was planned, that was his take on it. They carefully went over everyone, every name that was interviewed in the investigation. They narrowed the suspect list down to 10. Then they went one by one, looking at alibis, going over the statements that they gave, and narrowing it down to who they really could not rule out. And there was only one person that they really couldn't rule out. And that was <gasps> Father Ryan Erickson, the Catholic priest from the church. Ooh, it's getting complicated. Who is Ryan Erickson? What's the story? Why was he the suspect? Well, let me tell you, this is where this story gets spicy. Okay, so Ryan Erickson was the Roman Catholic associate priest at the St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Hudson. He was known as a young, energetic, charismatic, pistol packing priest. He owned like 16 guns and apparently he always had one in his belt. Like even while he was performing mass, like just a gun in his belt. He was also known for his extremely good aim. He was said to be ultra conservative and very passionate about 
two things, his opposition to abortion and homosexuality. During mass, he would frequently comment on his disdain over the orgy of handshaking and hugs of contemporary Catholic masses. He also apparently got really dramatic with mass. And during the consecration of the host, he would hold the host high above his head for over a minute, just dramatically holding like, you know, the, the wafer, the communion wait, the cracker. He would hold it above his head for over a minute while just sobbing, just tears running down his cheeks, just holding it up, crying. Can you imagine being like, just trying, just trying to go to church on Sunday, just, you know, is he crying? Is everything okay? So when Father Erickson joined this particular church in 2000, he pretty quickly divided the church. There was some talks like, okay, this guy is, he's a lot. You know, most of the people were in the middle, just kind of like, we're just trying to get to church. We're just trying to like say a few prayers and then get home for lunch, watch some football. You know, a guy catch the Packers game. Oh, you betcha. And then there was like a group over here that was like, he's so great. We love his conservative views. We love how he's not afraid to speak his mind and he's he's so great. And then there was this other group over here that was like, he's too much. This is bizarre. And we don't want him here. It sounds like some midnight mass stuff, like just standing up there crying and everyone's looking around like. The one thing that stood out to me was that he spoke frequently about his concern for temptations of the flesh temptations of the flesh. But he started escalating like a lot and he started raising more eyebrows, particularly when he sent out one of his thought of the day emails and it was like, uh -huh. and he sent it out to all the church members and it said, quote, even Sunday mass is not safe from the immodest dress of some devils. They come to read, give out holy communion, etc., looking like an advertisement. Their immodest dress says to all present, I'm easy, please go home and masturbate to my beautiful body. The sad thing is that some do, end quote. That is a lot <laughs> to unpack. Some of the women in the church were like, did he, did he just call me easy? Like, and the principal of the church school resigned shortly after that thought of the day email, cause she was like, you're too much. I'm out. So anyway, some of the more liberal members of the church were like, they were uncomfortable with him. One of which was, guess what? Big shock, Dan O'Connell. When police narrowed down the list to Ryan Erickson, they start digging into his past and guess what they found? Sexual misconduct. They found current 2004 allegations against Father Ryan Erickson that he had sexually abused an adolescent Boy, temptations of the flesh. The calls are coming from inside the house. So Seti said, obviously, like, just because the dude's, you know, a perv, that doesn't make him a murderer. You can't just be like, oh, well, he's a bad guy. Obviously he did it. Like, what's the motive? Where's the evidence? But that did give them a reason to bring him in for questioning, to try and get some info out of him. Also, I just wanna quickly point out, I probably don't need to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I'm not saying priest equals bad. I'm saying this particular priest is bad. He's a piece of shit who should not have become a priest. You know what I'm saying? You know, you get it, okay. Okay, so police bring in Father Ryan Erickson for a chat. And it's a good thing that they did. He was honestly probably like rattled enough from the sexual misconduct allegations. And now he's being hauled in for questioning by the police detectives that are investigating Dan O'Connell's murder. And he's like, oh my God, get the nerves. I bet he was shaking in his vestments. He had already left the parish in, in Hudson. He was already moved to a different church in a different town, right? He left shortly after the murders, wouldn't you know it? Isn't that suspicious? So they start questioning him about the abuse allegations and then they just sort of transition the questions into, hey, while you're here, um, you know, we're investigating the, the funeral home murders, right? Like, what do you know? What, do, what have you heard about it? And he was not good under pressure. He starts fumbling his words and he says, yeah, I mean, I heard, I heard, uh, 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 I heard some things, you know, I, I heard that Dan was shot at his desk and I heard that James was shot in a doorway. Investigators are like, where'd you hear that? And he's like, oh, I don't. I don't recall, maybe the news, I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying, I, I think I heard that somewhere. But, but, police never released that information. Oh no, they did not. They had interviewed 1,900 people, yeah, about these murders for over two years. And not one person mentioned the position of the bodies or where they were when they were shot. 
That was the police's hold back. They didn't tell the media. They didn't tell anybody that they interviewed. How'd he know that then? Mm, how did he know that then? You can watch the video of the interview of Father Erickson and you can like see and hear the exact moment when he realizes that he fucked up. I love seeing someone get like caught in a lie. It's awesome. I mean, he's not awesome, but seeing someone get caught in a lie is like, mm. But he tries to act like, oh no, I, I don't remember. I don't remember where I heard it. I heard it somewhere. You asked me a question, I answered it. If I say, oh, I don't know. I mean, that was a lie because obviously I heard it somewhere. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just answering your questions. So they ask him for his alibi. He goes through the whole timeline of his whole day. He says that from 12.30 to two o'clock, he was in his office on his computer. My favorite part of the interview is when they ask him, so if you killed Dan and you knew you could get away with it, would you tell us? And he's all, if I did it, I would be living with so much guilt and I'd been living with it for this long and you had me cornered, I'd break. Oh, I'd break. I know I would because the guilt would be too much for me. And the cop goes, but if you knew you could get away with it, would you tell us? And he goes, no, no. Well, I, I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, I, well, I mean, if, I mean, if I could, knew I could get away with it. I mean, human nature tells us to, to try and get away with it, you know? <laughs> It was so awkward and embarrassing. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, well, I mean, well, <laughs> it's just so awkward. And so they're like, well, if you did it and you got caught, what would you do? And he goes, well, I've thought about suicide before. And if I had done it, I would think about suicide. I, I would, if I did something that heinous. And they're like, oh, but you're not thinking about suicide now? And he's like, oh no, that's not the case. It was pretty painful to watch. If you get a chance, you should, I'll, I have some stuff in the description box if you want to watch a documentary about it and you can watch like the whole interview and it's just like, dude, seriously? <laughs> That whole conversation was enough for them to get a warrant. So they go to his office, they go through his computer and take a guess what they found on it. I'll give you a second, take a guess. Child pornography, of course they did, of course they did. Which no, that doesn't mean that he killed Dan and James, okay. But, ew. But they also found there was no activity on his computer from 1230 to two. Why? So it's starting to look like maybe Ryan Erickson was that 1 p.m. appointment, don't you think? Okay, so now they've busted up his alibi. They're trying to figure out a motive. So word's getting around in town that police are digging into Father Erickson. Not only about the sexual misconduct allegations, but also in regards to the funeral home murders. So people are talking. Small town. What? A witness comes forward. Oh, yes. The day of the shootings. Dan was having breakfast with a bus driver in town at one of the local stores at about 9.30 a.m. So she told police that Dan told her, well, I gotta go, I'm meeting with Ryan Erickson after lunch. And he told her that he was concerned about his behavior towards young boys and that there were allegations of touching. Dan's wife, Jenny, later stated that Dan was the kind of guy that would go at things head on. So she's like, I believe that he would have confronted Father Erickson and been like, Hey, what do you have to say about this? I wanted to talk to you before I go to the police, but I'm still going to police. So she believes that's what went down. So police are like, that's it, that's all we need. Let's go arrest him. So they race to the rectory to arrest Father Erickson, but when they get there, they're greeted with his superior, the deacon, and he informs them Father Erickson just killed himself. There were several notes on Erickson's desk. One was a last will and testament, and one was an apparent suicide note. And it basically stated that he didn't do it, he didn't kill Dan. In the note, he admitted that he drank way too much. He admitted to that the sexual misconduct allegations were true. He wrote that his ego, lust, and pride had gotten in the way of him being the best person he could be and that he was so tired, but that he did not kill Dan. Now, get this, the deacon that met them at the door, he informed them that a few days before the suicide, he overheard Father Erickson in his office banging his hands on his desk and then saying, fuck, I did it and they're gonna get me, like to himself. And the deacon poked his head in and was like, what are you talking about? And Erickson replied, do you know what they do to young guys in prison, especially priests? <laughs> I'm sorry, but if that's not a, if that's not a confession. Mm -hmm. So after the suicide, despite the note saying that Erickson did not kill Dan, Dan's family 
requested a John Doe proceeding. An oversimplification of what this is is basically that a trial is held with all of the evidence that they have, but because the defendant is deceased, the evidence is presented without a jury. And after hearing all the evidence and all the testimonies from 15 witnesses, Judge Lendell said, quote, I find that and conclude that Ryan Erickson probably committed these crimes in question. On a scale of one to 10, as far as strength of evidence, I would consider this 10. It is a very strong case for circumstantial evidence. DA Eric Johnson explained that the judge's ruling can be construed as a finding of guilt. Is that justice? I don't know. I don't know. I just wanna to touch more on the sexual assault allegations from 2004 because let's be real. Those accusations are the reason that we got even one iota of closure on the funeral home murders. Like if that victim of Ryan Erickson wouldn't have come forward, that bravery to come forward and accuse him of sexual misconduct is the reason that cops were able to question him and get more information on the funeral home murders in the first place. Friggin' hero, hero. And that wasn't the only sexual assault allegation. Upon further digging, police discovered, quote, when Erickson was six years old, he had sexual contact with a four-year-old cousin. When he was 19, he had sexual contact with a 14-year-old boy. And when he was 21, he was investigated for allegedly sexually assaulting a boy at a summer retreat. So, not great. Get this, according to the Bishop for the Roman Catholic Diocese in Superior, Wisconsin, at the time, the diocese was informed of the alleged sexual misconduct of Erickson in 1992, but an investigation by the Catholic authorities into Erickson concluded that, quote, he does not appear to be predatory or exploitative in his overall orientation, and he does not seem to be a high risk for acting in a sexually aggressive or manipulative manner in the future. So, Erickson was allowed to enter St. Paul Seminary and was ordained in June 2000 and then assigned to St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Hudson. <sighs> Fucking fantastic. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with Dan O'Connell dead because he had the guts to confront Father Ryan Erickson with the allegations before he went to police to get his side of the story. It leaves us with James Ellison, the 22 year old intern, dead because he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. It leaves us with closure, but no justice. And we're left with a bad taste in our mouths because the diocese was informed of Ryan Erickson's misconduct before he was even ordained as a priest with the Catholic Church. As early as 1992, but they still let him become a priest. Great job, excellent. Well done. Not. And so ends the story of Ryan Erickson, who probably murdered two people to cover up his depravity. And when that didn't work, he committed suicide and took away the chance for closure and justice for Dan and James's family and friends. And I think I can safely speak for everyone when I say, fuck that guy. So what do you think? Sound off with respect in the comments. I wanna hear your side of it. Well, rest in peace to Dan O'Connell and James Ellison. As far as Father Ryan Erickson goes, Bye, bitch. We won't miss you. And that's the end of the story. I hope you got some good cleaning done and I hope I entertained you with a true crime story. If you liked this video, please give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment. Tune in next week for another episode of Cleaning and Crime. Thank you guys so much for watching today and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.